Death is an inaccessible frontier for us. We just can't seem to figure out what happens after it. If someone ceases to exist, they can't report back what happens after they die, they're just gone. So we've developed complex traditions around the tragedy of death. For example, in Christianity, people have a wake, funeral mass, and burial in a Christian cemetery. Christians believe that the morality and life choices of the deceased ultimately dictate their final destination. Meaning if they're good, they go to heaven, but if they're bad, they go to hell. The context in which these rituals and traditions occur are influenced by the shapers of the built environment. I'm talking about architects, landscape architects, civil engineers, etc. They have a vital and sacred duty to fulfill, providing a space that connects the terrestrial and the divine. For example, a Gothic cathedral uses lots of natural light to communicate the metaphor of light and the divine, aka God and heaven. So at a funeral, people would be reminded that their loved ones were not facing some kind of eternal oblivion, but instead were in the kingdom of heaven. While religions offer guidance to what happens with people after death, there's another thing tied up with death that people place a lot of emphasis on, legacy. How will people remember me? Yes, they have children to pass on their DNA, but they also want their grandchildren and great-grandchildren to remember their contributions to their family and their community. When highly successful people grow old, they may, for example, engage in lots of philanthropy and sponsor the arts so people remember them as being charitable. For example, Andrew Carnegie's Carnegie Hall. Other wealthy families and individuals, especially those with an interest in art and design, want a physical imprint in the built environment. They want to leave something behind that connects them to posterity. In this video, I am going to tell the story of the Brion Vega Company, whose products set the standard in Italian mid-century design. I'll discuss the cemetery built to honor the company's founder. Then I'll evaluate how successful the cemetery actually is at communicating the family's values. So don't go anywhere. My name is Angelo and this is Architecture with Angelo. After the fascist government of Italy was overthrown, Italy embraced all things modern, desiring to rebuild from the ashes and progress forward. Italy continued to play an important role in design, from architecture and technology to fashion. The Brion Vega Company stands out for its futuristic design, embracing the minimalism and form follows function aesthetic of the 1950s and 1960s. The company, founded as BPM Radio in 1945, was rebranded to Brion Vega in 1963. Founded by Giuseppe Brion, this company, despite competition from countries like America and West Germany at the time, managed to establish itself in the consumer electronics space, creating TV sets, radios, and other audio equipment. Its products won several design awards and are today featured in contemporary art museums like the Pompidou Center in Paris. The company is a microcosm of the Italian post-war economic miracle and optimism of the period, shedding itself from its dark fascist past and enjoying the blessings of post-war capitalism. The company still exists and you can buy their products. They are pricey though, being up to $20,000. These products are modern with Bluetooth compatibility, etc., but the design is timeless. As I mentioned earlier, we all think about our legacies when we grow old. For a family that made its fortune off of industrial design, the Brions wanted to preserve their love for modernism. After the death of Giuseppe Brion in 1968, his wife, Onorina, wanted a cemetery to be designed for Giuseppe. She wanted more than just a headstone to remember him. She wanted to leave an imprint on the built environment, wishing to create a cemetery complex and tomb situated in their homeland, the Veneto region. They commissioned Carlo Scarpa, an Italian architect whose work combined the simplicity of modernism and a focus on the connection between landscape and architecture. Scarpa traveled frequently to Japan, paying close attention to how landscape and architecture, when combined, create lasting and positive experiences for people. He shared his admiration for Japan with Frank Lloyd Wright, whose organic geometry and natural forms inspired Scarpa greatly. What Wright and Scarpa shared was a different approach to modern architecture than many of their contemporaries. After World War II, architects departed from the traditional building styles through a whole-scale embrace of the international style, designing glass and steel buildings and favoring light colors. For these architects, light is a metaphor for progress and needs to be maximized. Scarpa, however, approached his craft differently. He preferred his buildings to function as more background noise to their surroundings, meaning their context for life to occur not drawing much attention to themselves. Working in the Veneto region, tradition and architectural modesty were favored over flashy and avant-garde forms, unlike in, say, the city of Milan. Consequently, Scarpa's work was heavily reductive and contextual, weaving modern materials and construction methods with traditional forms and culture. This made him a perfect candidate to design the Brion Cemetery, 
as his site-specific modern style makes his architecture unique. His commitment to detail can be appreciated by Onorina, who believed that the family legacy would be in excellent hands. The site of the family selected is a peculiar L-shape surrounded by an existing cemetery located in San Vito, a hamlet located in the town of Altivoli, which is in the Veneto region. The cemetery is located at the end of a narrow paved road and is surrounded by farmland. Scarpa's design builds on this energy and this context, creating his own calm and tranquil environment. The site feels secluded and private, perfect features for a final resting place. The Brion family addition has two entrances, the chapel entrance that directly connects to the street, and another entrance through the existing cemetery. In the existing cemetery, people are directed by a linear path toward a concrete enclosure, softened by vines and other vegetation. The enclosure features two interlocking circles which create an aperture in the concrete. This is called a vesica piscis. This sacred geometry is hopeful because it conveys the eternal life shared by Giuseppe and his wife. From this entrance, people can turn either left or right. If they turn right, they are directed towards the meditation pavilion and pond. The concrete appears to float, seemingly defying physics in the process. It provides protection, giving people cover, enhancing their experience of the space. They can listen to the relaxing sound of the laving water, look at the lily pads, and reflect on their own life, and feel a sense of peace for what will come next. Scarpa's sensitivity to context is seen here, as water is deeply ingrained into the consciousness of the Veneto region. After all, where would the region be if it were not for Venice, its most popular city? Water and navigation go hand in hand for Venetians. It gives life to this region. Scarpa knows this and uses water throughout the complex to symbolize the shared experience of life. If people wanted to turn left at the entrance, they would be guided towards the Arcosolium by narrow strips of water. An Arcosolium is an arched recess in which a tomb is located. These can be seen in churches in early Christian catacombs. Scarpa uses the sacred form to memorialize the Brion couple and illustrate their love for each other. The tombs lean toward each other, giving off a magnetic energy and a heavenly aura. The simple earth-like nature of concrete combined with the tombs being placed below ground combines early Christian burial with modern building techniques, engaging the landscape in the process. Onorina could have had the cemetery designed in whatever style she desired. She had a lot of money. Instead, she allowed for Scarpa to be minimalist. For her, death is kind of a great equalizer. All of us, regardless of our fame and fortune, will end up in the same state after we die. From the Arcosolium, people can travel back to the original path, traversing through a passageway-like corridor and into the chapel. Inside the chapel, the walls are bare, but heavily detailed with abstract geometric patterns. Near the top, sharp edges wrap around, recalling an Egyptian pyramid or Art Deco carving. Wood, brass, linen, and marble accent the interior. Small apertures allow for light to permeate and also function as framing elements for surrounding structures. There are no paintings here, just geometric architecture, showing Scarpa's commitment to simplicity in design. The subdued color palette is Scarpa creating a relaxing environment that allows for people to reflect on their lives and the lives of the departed. Surrounding the chapel is a moat with concrete step patterns emerging from the water and forming the structure. Again, we see how water ties together the complex and is a symbol of life. It surrounds the chapel to remind us that death and life are complementary forces and that we must accept that with the beauty of life comes the tragedy of death. But the relaxing atmosphere of the chapel reminds us that we should accept death because with death comes eternal life in the next realm. Now let's circle back to the Brion family. Why did Onorina commission Scarpa to design this complex? What's wrong with just a simple grave? To dig deeper, we need to think about the legacy that the Brion family wants to leave behind. They want to be remembered not only for their industrial design, but for their actual imprint on the built environment. Because of them, Italians have this sanctuary where they can appreciate the value of their own lives. They can sit on the platform overlooking the pond or pray quietly in the chapel for their loved ones. The Brion family had a sophisticated grasp on the interrelationship between life and death, and were also confident in where they would go when it was their turn to pass on. The interlocking rings affirm this, eternal life in paradise. This complex is a bold endeavor by Scarpa, and the generous budget allocated to its construction allowed for him to have basically free reign over the site and let his ideas run wild. In my opinion, he perfectly encapsulated the essence of the Brion family. What made this family special was the creation of the Brion Vega Company, which produced cutting-edge sleek technology. And this design still holds up today, after half a century. People will spend as much as $20,000 buying these products, because it's a timeless look. What separates mediocre and excellent design is how it holds up several decades from its completion. 
For example, Falling Water looks just as good as it did when it was completed in 1939. When Scarpa designs, he doesn't think about how it will look 10 years from now. He thinks about how it will look 100 years from now, creating an architecture of timelessness. His work draws from the past because he recognizes that the best architecture is deeply connected to its site. There's an energy that comes with great architecture like this, which will always attract people. It's why his project is so special, just like the family it was built for.